Okay, th uh, my name is Keith Christian, and thanks very much for joining us for the third webinar uh, for, of the Charles Darwin Evolution in Tropical Australia MOOC. This week we're going to be looking at Wallacea and biogeography. As I said, um, my name is Keith Christian, and uh, this week I'd like to introduce Dr. Steve Reynolds, who I'm sure all of you have already seen on the MOOC, but uh, he's with us here for this webinar. So thanks, thanks, Steve, and welcome. Uh, yes, good morning, everybody, or whatever time it is, uh, wherever you are. Um, I'm um, glad to be glad to be back here for webinar three um, to talk about Wallace and, and biogeography. Um, I'm actually currently in the uh, the Kimberley region of Western Australia, so I'm still in uh, Northern Australia, in Monsoonal Australia, um, a little bit uh, west of Darwin and. A slightly lower rainfall area, so a little bit different to um, what we get in the top end. Um, and I'd just like to thank uh, uh, Janet, Janet Brown for uh, doing the last two webinars, which was great, um, answering all the questions about Darwin, uh, including a few questions that I had that the teeth asked us, so that was really good. Um, so, but this week, uh, part three, uh, we move on to uh, the Malay Archipelago and, and Wallace and the life of Wallace. So, um, once again, in this webinar, we will um, look at some points of interest, in particular uh, some animal distributions in relation to Wallace's line. And as usual, if you want to um, uh, respond to the questions, we'll have some polling and also a bit of chat. Uh, if you want to chat, use the chat box. So uh, most of you should be familiar now with this, uh, the chat box down the bottom there. So you can just type in there, press enter. And, uh, and away we go and ask questions and so on as we go. We'll try to answer some of those questions during the course of the webinar. Um, so we have a few just sort of quick quiz questions um, about animals and plants and their distributions. Uh, so just indicate using the, uh, the polling button um, your answer A, B or C. So what have we done this week in part three? Uh, so first of all, of course, um, there's information about Alfred Wallace and his life, uh, how he traveled to the Amazon. He spent uh, four years in the Amazon. Um, he then came back to London, then he went away again after, after vowing and declaring he would never go on the ocean again. He went to the Malay Archipelago, as it was an area that, that had been, was poorly, um, very few explorers had been there from Europe. He spent eight years in the Malay Archipelago, a very long time, um, and then came up with some ideas, which we've spoken about, Wallace Line and so on. And uh, we've also talked a little bit about Darwin and Wallace in terms of how they came together. Uh, there was this overlap when Wallace sent the letter to Darwin that precipitated the whole series of events, publishing of the, the natural selection of the theory and then eventually really forced Darwin into, into publishing The Origin of Species as well. So Wallace was really important uh, in, in terms in relation to Darwin as well. So I'm hoping all of you are familiar now with um, this map, uh, which, we should, which you should see on the, on the MOOC. Um, so in particular, uh, the Wallace line. So as we've mentioned, it runs between Bali and Lombok here in the Lombok Strait. Wallace also placed it between Sulawesi and Borneo and uh, up towards underneath the Philippines. So he travelled, as we mentioned, a long way. So he visited Java, he visited Bali, he hopped across to Lombok, he visited Timor, he visited the island of Aru, he spent time in the Moluccas. So he spent a long time, he also went to this bottom part of Sulawesi here. So he spent a long time, eight years, travelling around and that's when he started to realise that there was a line somewhere that demarcated the Oriental fauna and the Australasian fauna. So we're just going to have some questions um, about really in relation to that Wattles' line, um, which side of these lines, of the line are the animals from? So we have the Oriental side, so the, the Asian side, uh, west of the line or northwest of the line, and the Australasian side, so Australia, New Guinea, uh, that side. Um, or are they a bit of both? Are they moving uh, or are they distributed on, on either side of the line? So the first example 
um, we thought about is the, the salamanders. So um, there's actually quite a diverse range of salamanders. So they're the amphibians, uh, but they're amphibians with tails. So there's three major groups of amphibians. There's the, the anura, which is the frogs and the toads. There's the, um, the salamanders, which, have, which actually have a tail. And then there's these odd uh, burrowing forms, the Sicilians, in tropical places around the world. And so the uh, question is about salamanders. Which, which side of the line uh, would you say that they are from? So um, we go to the next slide. So really, um, I guess, so for me being from Australia, um, the first time that I actually saw a salamander was when I visited North America, when I visited the United States. So uh, in Australia, you know, we don't have salamanders at all. Uh, so they're a group that, you know, they're in South America, they're in North America, they're in Europe, um, but they really never made it down to, um, down to Australia. Uh, and this, presumably, like most amphibians, they have wet skin and so on, so they have a little bit of uh, trouble, if you like, travelling around, hopping from island to island and crossing ocean barriers. So what we do have in Australia is um, several of the tree frogs. So this is the, the Hylidae family. So this is a, a Latoria bicolor, a, a slender tree frog from northern Australia. And this is another example of one of our tree frogs. So we do have lots of frogs. And in fact, we have several families of frogs uh, that occur in Australia. Um, so amongst the, the tree frogs, uh, this group called the Hylidae, and it's interesting that this Hylidae is shared or related to a group in South America, so a Gondwanan uh, link, so a very ancient link. Um, we also have uh, frogs that live on rocks. This is Victoria Copelandi and terrestrial frogs. So this is a rocket frog or a Latorian Azuda. Yeah, I, was, I might just break um, in there, Steve. The, I might just break in there and, yeah. and just uh, say that this group of frogs uh, illustrates a, re a really, uh, is a very good illustration of adaptive radiation. So started out with a, a tree frog and now in, in Australia we have the tree frog family, a group of frogs, some, some of which are in the trees, some of which are in, in the ground, some of which are actually burrowing frogs and uh, some live more or less like a typical pond, fro pond frog. Um, so they're an extremely diverse group, but ph phylogenetically they're, they're, they're in the tree frog family. Yeah, yeah so they have um, really evolved into that sort of lots of forms in Australia, and they also um, occur in, in New Guinea as well. So again, that, that really Australasian side of the line. Um, we have several other families, so this is an example of the Myobatrachidae, which is small ground frogs, and this, the Limitonacidae, which is sort of larger ground frogs, several, several genera, and both these families are largely restricted to uh, Australia, but again, related to a family, the Leptodactylidae, uh, which is from South America, and for a long time were considered as part of that same family. It's only recently that they've been really, and it's been accepted that they are different families, uh, different families of frogs from the ones in South America. So obviously, again, a very ancient lineage dating from Gondwana. So the next example uh, we looked at is woodpeckers, and I think most people are familiar with these birds. Um, they, you know, they do, they go up and down tree trunks and they dig holes and they grab insects from, from the holes that they dig. Um, and again, so the question is about whether, which side of the line these uh, woodpeckers are from, uh, the oriental side or, or the Australasian side or kind of maybe a bit of both. Um, and so if we think about that, um, really again, um, the oriental side is, um, they've come down so Again, they're in the Northern Hemisphere, there's a lot of woodpeckers, but they also are in South America. Um, but in Asia, they're very common, say, for example, in India and in places, there's a lot of species there. Some of them have made their way down through the Malay archipelago, uh, 
and I think there are something like five or six species on Bali, for example. But as you go through down into Nusa Tenggara, so east of Bali, there's only really one species of woodpecker. And in New Guinea, there are no woodpeckers, and in Australia, no woodpeckers at all. So a few got across the line, uh, and then none actually made it to Australia. So um, you would say mostly oriental, um, and basically some in Indonesia, but yeah. So it's a group that hasn't actually managed to get to Australia. Maybe in, maybe in the distant future. But what's interesting is Australia does have other similar things um, like tree creepers and satellas that crawl up and down trunks and pick pick uh, insects and so on. Well, they, they look under bark, but they don't actually dig holes as woodpeckers do. So nothing's evolved this ability to actually dig, dig holes in tree trunks. So um, this is uh, just a general comment then in relation to, this is a quote from Wallace from the Malay Archipelago. Hopefully all of you are now reading the Malay Archipelago in your spare time. Um, and it's interesting in terms of, this is how Wallace summarised things at the time. And he points out that um, Australia doesn't have all of these groups. So these are all um, in this first paragraph here. These are all uh, placental mammals. So tigers, wolves, bears, all those sorts of things, elephants, all these things we think of as being, you know, uh, mammals, uh, characteristically. Um, but I think what's interesting is that some of these animals actually do now occur in Australia. So for example, we do have sheep because we have lots of sheep farms and stations. We do have horses and some of those are running wild as well. And of course the rabbit, which, um, you know, has been feral for a long time and has, has uh, expanded across most of uh, southern Australia and at times has been in you know, absolutely enormous numbers. Um, the other point he mentions here is that it has marsupials only. Um, so, yeah, that, that's, wanna, that was one place where Wallace got it wrong. Wallace, Wallace got that wrong. They, they, it's mostly marsupials, but. Uh, in fact, there are bats in Australia and there are rodents in Australia. And there are about uh, 60 species of rodents in Australia and all but and most of those are, have, have been here for a very long time, so they're na native animals. About four or five species that have been relatively recently introduced as humans uh, have, have brought them from other parts of the world, but uh, about 55 species of, of native rodents. And of course, rodents are, are typically, uh, particularly the mice and rats, and all, and all the uh, Australian rodents are in the family Muridae, which is the, the, the rats and mice. And those are all uh, very characteristically very good colonizers. They're, they're good at stowing on ships and boats. They're good at stowing on um, rafts, and they can survive in generalist feeders, and so they can survive long, long rafting trips across water and um, are generally very good uh, colonizers. Yeah, so that's right. And so the, the, they seem to, it seems as though the rodents have been in Australia probably for um, five million years or something, uh, relatively recent, and then they've, but in that time they've evolved into several different genera. And as, as Keith mentioned, 50 or more, more species of native Australian rodents, so they're actually quite common. Um, Wallace also mentioned um, birds and says here, in birds it is almost as peculiar. Um, and as we mentioned, no woodpeckers, um, but other sorts of families as well. But what it does have is the, the brush turkey, so we mentioned the scrub fowl and that group, the megapodes, the honey suckers. Now, uh, we now call them honey eaters. Um, Wallace had this lovely name of honey suckers. And, this is an example here of the brown honey eater. Now, the brown honey eater is very widespread in Australia. It's one of Australia's most common birds. But it's interesting because it's, it's a species that's gone the other way. So it's, it occurs in New Guinea. It's gone along quite a few of the islands of Nusa Tenggara, and it reaches as far as Bali. So it's a honey eater that's gone west and has just crossed the Wallace line. To reach Bali, so it is, it is actually reasonably common uh, bird in Bali. So it's one honey eater that's very widespread and moved around a lot. A few other things like fry birds and so on have also made their way up through um, through those some of those islands. Um, but there's just one or two species that are very widespread. 
Um, and I just put in this example here, this is a mistletoe bird, and this is an example of something coming the other way. This is a group called the flower packers, and there's quite a lot of species in Asia, but only this single species, the mistletoe bird, uh, in Australia that's actually reached Australia and occurs over most of Australia. So it's the only one that's made it this far. So one going one way and one going the other way. Um, so again, just thinking about these distributions, I think this is probably a, a fairly obvious one. Um, uh, rock wallabies, so there's, there's um, quite a few of these species. As their name, their common name suggests, um, generally living in very rocky habitats, in rocky rocky ranges, uh, hills, granite tours, all sorts of places, anywhere where there's lots of um, nice rocky places and little caves and, and places where they can hide away. Um, so again, the question about whether, which side of the line they're on, um, and as for most of the macropods, so they're in this, that large group, the macropodidae, uh, which includes the kangaroo, kangaroo, sorry, the wallabies, the paddy melons, the rock wallabies, all those sorts of things. Um, so as you would imagine, uh, this, this example here is the short eared rock wallaby. There he is sitting on the rock and actually they just sort of disappear into those rocks. They're very hard to see. Um, and this is one in Litchfield National Park, which is just south of Darwin. And so this short eared rock wallaby is actually quite common across northern Australia, wherever there's rocky habitat and especially where there's, where there's near water. Um, and so there are now 16 species of what will be recognised in Australia and these include, for example, some species in deserts and you can see this distribution here. Uh, these are basically areas that are suitable in terms of big rocks or ranges or so on in, in the middle of the desert, so there's some desert species. There's other species in northern Australia and there's also a group of species that now occur down the eastern seaboard. So again, some genetic studies have increased a number of recognised species once again. It seems to be a common theme uh, these days. Uh, okay, so another example. Um, now this is a cuscus. So some people might have heard of, uh, of a, a cuscus. Um, it's a little bit of an unusual animal. It, as you can see, it has a, a slightly uh, prehensile tail. I think the tail is used to curl around branches. It can't hang off it like some monkeys can, for example. Um, but it certainly does use this prehensile tail in the climbing. And this is an unusual uh, looking, looking fellow. Um, so do people think about um, whether this, this species uh, is oriental or Australasian or both? Um, so, let's see. So, if we look here, I think this, this, uh, the name of the, the cuscus might give it away. Um, so, this is the Sulawesi bear cuscus. So, people remember um, where Sulawesi is. So, just on the, just on the eastern side of the water sign. So, um, if we go back to, I'll just try and go back to this slide here. So there's Sulawesi uh, just on the side. So it's, it is on the Australasian side, but only just if you like. And there's a few unusual animals like this that occur on Sulawesi. There's a lot of endemic species. And this is in fact a marsupial and related to other climbing uh, marsupials like the possums and there are other cuscus species as well in New Guinea and particularly in tropical parts, so like tropical North Queensland. But the Sulawesi bear cuscus is a, um, appears to have been there for a long time and Wallace actually had a bit of difficulty with Sulawesi. He wasn't always sure where to put it, whether he should put it on one side of the line or the other side of the line um, because it's a bit of a mix of species Oriental and Australasian, plus it's a lot of its own endemic species that I mentioned. Um, and as it turns out, uh, geologically speaking, and so there's been a lot of um, work on, on the geology of the region since Wallace, particularly in the last 40 or 50 years, and what it suggests that was that Sulawesi itself 
is composed of different parts. So if we look at 30 million years ago, so quite some time ago, this is thought to be the configuration of the land at the time. And so you can see Australia down here, there's Northern Australia and the top of Queensland and, and what was New Guinea or prior to actual proto New Guinea. And here we can see Borneo and Java. And so at various times, this was all joined up. And what happened over time is that parts of the Australasian plate joined. And so Australia itself is composed of two, two parts that joined together and form one landmass. And so probably what happened with the Sulawesi bear cuscus, it arrived sometime around, you know, maybe this sort of time, 20 million years ago. But then later, these islands here became separated. It was separated by an oceanic barrier and it was stuck there on Sulawesi for a long time and evolved and changed and became quite different from other cuscus species that we know. So it's quite distinctive, it's quite unusual. And there are other unusual animals uh, on Sulawesi. Um, and just so if we look at the marsupials generally, as I mentioned, there's, this is the number of genera. Um, so there's a single one on Sulawesi. Um, some have reached some of these islands close to New Guinea, Buru and Saram. Uh, four genera on this island, Mysul near New Guinea. And one genera which has almost got up to the Philippines. So. The marsupials did spread a fair way, but still didn't quite cross the line, which is which is over here. So, and of course, in New Guinea, there's actually quite a diverse array of marsupials, including several genera that occur in New Guinea and not in Australia. So, okay. Um, and if we think about the marsupials generally, um, we've mentioned how they occur in Australia. So this is now looking at a world map. They also occur in South America, and a single species has moved up into the southern parts of North America. Um, but of course, they are um, they are all marsupials. So this is an Australian example of, of a possum, um, and this is a South American example of, an, of like what they call an opossum. So they are in different families. Um, this is now the Delphi Day and this whole group in South America are now thought to be a whole separate um, a whole separate group separate from the marsupials, still all marsupials because they all have, uh, if you look at this next slide, possess certain features like for example the pouch or marsupium, so there you can see the joey, this is in a western grey kangaroo uh, sitting inside the pouch, it's getting a bit big but they still do jump back in the pouch even when they get quite big if there's danger or something. So most or all of them uh, have a pouch, although some have odd things like wombats have a pouch facing backwards. There's a few strange things like that. Um, but they all possess a series of features that separate them from the placental mammals um, and make them all, you know, they are all marsupials. All right, so we've got a few more people joining now. So let's see if we can get people to vote um, on this next uh, this next slide. So use your uh, use your polling polling button there to select to respond to the poll. So the fourth button on the right, um, A, B, or C. So again, we're looking at so in terms of the the Oriental side, the Asian side, the Australasian side, so Australia and New Guinea, or perhaps spread out through that through that whole area. Uh, so that would be both. Um, and now we're going to look at some plant uh, examples. So, let's see now. So, this is a forest. Uh, it's quite a tall forest. Um, it's called, it's a carry forest. So these actually grow to be one of the tallest uh, trees in the world. Um, some, some very tall examples up there with some of the big trees like the sequoia and so on. Um, one of, certainly one of the biggest hardwoods uh, in the world. So um, this is, uh, let's see if people, what people think about, I think we've just got a few votes there, so let's see if I can put those up. Um, we've got a few people coming in here and suggesting that, okay, we're mostly going for Australasian, although there's a few, there's one there which says both. Now let's, I'll just go to this next slide and let's see, so it's uh, 
it's a species of eucalyptus. So um, I think if I, if I had mentioned that, that would pretty much give it away. Um, so it's one of the eucalypts, and of course eucalyptus is widespread across Australia, very characteristic of the Australian bush. Wherever you go, pretty much you will see species of eucalyptus. And yesterday, um, I went and collected a, a little sample. This is a species that occurs, um, as you can see that there. This is a species that occurs uh, in the Kimberley region of Western Australia. And it has these, uh, these large uh, capsules. And the species name eucalyptus means well covered. And what it means is that the capsule itself is covered. It has a little cap on it and that pops off. And when that pops off, the seeds can come out. This is a, actually an example of um, a bloodwood. So there are a series of bees, particularly in Northern Australia, which is a whole subgroup within eucalyptus. And now a lot of, um, most botanists now recognize a group, Carindia, uh, which is the bloodwoods and the ghost gums, which is within, uh, which is now separated from eucalyptus. So they're all eucalyptus before, now we've got Carindias and we've got the eucalyptus, uh, eucalyptus group. Um, so, as I mentioned, eucalypts are really characteristic of Australia, but here's a photo of uh, a, a site in East Timor, so northwest of Australia, and what you can see here is eucalypts on the hills. And so there's, uh, I think, three or four species of eucalypts in Timor. Uh, a few species did get there, of course, eucalypts in New Guinea, uh, in fact, if you go to the savannas in the southern part of New Guinea, they're very similar to the sorts of savannas you'd see in northern Australia in the top end. Um, and a few species up through the Moluccas, and in fact, I think one species of eucalyptus that's actually made it to the Philippines. So again, up through Asia, but didn't cross the Wallace line. All right. Uh, another species of plant, and I think this might be in the MOOC. So if people have been looking through the examples in the MOOC, um, they might have come across this one. Uh, and again, so if you can use your uh, polling buttons, uh, the Niper palm. So here you can see it uh, fringing uh, an estuary, an estuarine area. Uh, so it lives in areas that um, have um, not oceanic, but where there's a mingling of fresh water and salt water, so estuarine areas, so relatively low salinity, but they can tolerate some salinity. So near the coast, uh, in big rivers and, and uh, deltas and places like that. So um, let's see what people think about that. If I just bring up, let's see what... Um, so now we've got oriental, which is which is good. It does look very oriental. And if we think about palms, you know, we think about the tropics, although there are some palm species in Australia. Um, and some people have gone both. Now, we're roughly split, more than some people don't know what they think. Um, so in relation to the Niper palm, the people who said both are actually correct. And we've spoken a bit about how various animals and plants Oh, there we go. Someone said they might have seen this in Borneo, and that's quite possible. So some of these plants, and we've spoken about mangroves as well in the MOOC, they have special propagules. So these are the seed cases. And if we think about something like the coconut, this does some other things. It can float around. It gets washed up on a beach or in an estuary somewhere. It germinates, and then it can grow there. So these, this niper palm is widespread all the way down through Asia, uh, right across Wallace's line, down to New Guinea, and even uh, occurs in northern Australia. So on Melville Island, which is just north of Darwin, it occurs, but it doesn't occur at Darwin. So it's reached northern, the very northern parts of northern Australia as well. So because of its dispersal ability, it's spread right across and right through that area. And the line for the Niper Palm is really um, not much of a line at all, let's say. Um, so, okay, so we've, I think we've, we've, we've covered that enough. Um, and so, like the Niper palm, there are some other groups, particularly of, of uh, animals, that have crossed the line. And some that we've mentioned in the MOOC, uh, 
are things like certain birds, so shorebirds, which actually have an annual migration and move back and forth across the line and go from the northern hemisphere all the way down to the southern hemisphere every year. So line makes no difference to them. Uh, bats, again, which move around a lot. Rodents, which we've already mentioned. Uh, Keith spoke about those. Uh, things like mangroves and also these um, these colubrid snakes. So this is an example of a colubrid snake in northern Australia. It's come down from Asia where there's lots of colubrids. And this is a, a keelback snake. Another group uh, which is of particular interest, I think, is, is the goannas. Yeah, I might say a few words about those, Steve. <clears throat> so um, <Yeah. clears throat> we, we talk about the goannas in the MOOC, and they're an interesting group in that if you just looked at the distribution of goannas, of varanid lizards in the world, you'd probably come to the conclusion that they originated in Australia because Australia has the most number of species. Uh, they're, they're, they're in other parts of Asia. They're in the Philippines. They're right across to India and in Africa. So they're quite a wide, widespread family of, of lizards. But the biggest number of species and the most diversity is in Australia. But in fact, if you look at the fossil record, it's very clear that there were um, that varanids in, Aust in um, Eurasia for a much longer period. So they originated in Eurasia, made their way down uh, to Australia, and then once they got to Australia, really diversified. I and mean, there's not only uh, more species, but um, most of the species in, in, in Asia and Africa are look like uh, this, this larger species here are generally big bodied lizards. Uh, but in Australia, not only are those, there are the medium and big size, but there's a whole group of really small goannas uh, that are much more, look mo more like a typical lizard, more of a, a, a typical lizard size. And so that's a whole separate um, subgenus of, uh, of, of varanid lizards. So, uh, uh, and, and another interesting fact is that they've come to Australia in a couple of different waves, so in a couple of different eva invasions. The, f the first invasion was a very long time ago, um, and that's where most of the diversity came, but there's been more recent invasions, so, such as the, the uh, mangrove monitor, which is also a, a, a species, or at least very closely related species, were found right through uh, big areas of Southeast Asia and even in the Pacific in places like Guam and, and other uh, Pacific islands. Uh, they, they live close to the sea and they're very, you know, reptiles in general are pretty good colonizers in the sense that if they get swept out to sea on a raft or a log, they can survive a long time without eating. They can, um, they don't need food every day. They don't need water every day. They have very, uh, unlike the, the uh, salamanders that we talked about earlier, they, they have uh, resistance to water loss, so they, they don't dry out very quickly, they don't need to drink very often, uh, fresh water very often, and they can they, they, uh, make really good colonizers. And so uh, it's interesting to note that goannas have invaded Australia uh, a couple of times. Right, and actually, and then yeah, there's quite a diversity of species uh, in Australia. So, um, keep mentioning lots of those little little ones. Um, so yeah, so a few quite a few species that have managed to get, get across. And I guess the there's sort of a the idea, I suppose, that people think perhaps more about these days. And I think we're probably getting that idea across is this idea of what's called a double filter, in terms of what you really have is you have oriental fauna that's pushed down through the Malay Archipelago, through Java and across into Tangara. And then you've had Australian species that are in this whole region of Australia and New Guinea and have pushed back up towards the oriental fauna. So rather than having a line, which is a really strict sort of demarcation boundary type of thing, you've really got a merging of two faunas, one moving up from Australia and one moving down from, from the Orient. So um, I think in a way this, this might be perhaps a better way of, of thinking about it. And in addition to that, you have particularly in these areas here, in these little islands, and, but also on Sulawesi as we've mentioned, uh, speciation on those islands 
so that you also have in addition, so these animals have arrived there and then speciated and then so you've got additional species that might be restricted to just one or a few of these islands type of thing. So, uh, so that's on top of this, this dispersal and movement uh, of animals around through the archipelago. Um, so sort of related to that, I just wanted to mention uh, this about that there's um, several families of geckos that occur in Australia. And again, thinking about this idea of dispersal, um, we have, or you know, and how, how animals got to where they are. If we go down here, first of all, this is an example of the Diplodactylidae. So there are now thought to be several what are called families of geckos in Australia. Um, and this is a group, this is an example of a, a Strohurus, uh, it's a spiny tail uh, gecko. Uh, these are uh, generally, this one's arboreal, as you can see. This whole group, Diplotilidae, uh, which consists of several genera, is restricted to Australia, but they're also representatives in New Zealand and, um, and New Guinea, and also New Caledonia, so out in the ocean a bit. And so the link there is that these are Gondwana. These are species that evolved in Gondwana times um, when New Zealand and Australia presumably were linked still and then New Zealand went off, rafted across into the ocean, Australia drifted north. Um, so there are still representatives that are sort of related. But And so, for example, some of the ones in New Zealand actually live bearers, which is very unusual for geckos. Most geckos lay eggs. The other group in Australia is the Carpodactylidae. And these things, like this um, knob-tailed gecko, unusual funny-looking things, look like muppets. Um, the barking geckos, the leaf-tailed geckos, are really just restricted to Australia. Um, so they're Australian endemics, and again, presumably then a Gondwanan group. Um, the Geconidae, on the other hand, are very widespread um, throughout the world. And this is an example of the Gohira. This is on, living on rocks. There are ones that are living in trees. Uh, there are several genera, and including also some relatively recent arrivals. So things that are probably still arriving uh, now, um, and this is a very large family of geckos. And um, so, yeah, they're, they're, they're quite a widespread group. So they're ones that are shared with other parts of the world. Yeah. I might just uh, pop in there. Stephen's say, uh, talk a little bit about reptile eggs. Most reptiles lay eggs. Um, the eggs of crocodiles are hard shelled. To, they're very much like a bird egg. The eggs of, of uh, turtles are also almost as hard. They're very quite rigid shelled eggs. Most lizards and snakes have a, a very, a, what's called a parchment shelled egg, and it's uh, more like a leathery kind of egg. And it's mu those eggs are much more susceptible to desiccation, and they, they have to be laid in particular, particular environments where there's enough moisture for the eggs to not only not lose too much water, but they t the advantage of having that kind of an egg is that they typically take up water from the soil, suck up water from the soil, and that means that the embryos can can get quite a bit bigger uh, and use the water from the environment as opposed to the water from the, the mother. Geckos are, are unusual among, among the lizards in that some geckos have the parchment-shelled eggs and some geckos have hard-shelled eggs. And these, uh, the widespread geconidae that you mentioned are all over the world, or lo lots of different places in the world, are the group that have the hard-shelled eggs. And that's probably helped them quite a bit in their colonizing ability. In other words, once they get to a place, um, they don't have to be quite as particular uh, about finding a very specific place to lay their eggs. These eggs, these lizards lay their eggs in all sorts of places, uh, even not even necessarily buried, but under rocks or just in pretty exposed places and they are able to survive. And so that's probably has one of the factors, at least, that has contributed to this group being very widespread. Yeah, that's right. And so, so for example, one of the groups that um, people in Darwin are very familiar with is the, um, the what's called the Asian the house gecko, Hemidactylus frenatus. And uh, they come around to people's lights and so on, and they make noises. Now, it's actually a species that's, that's arrived in Australia relatively recently, probably in the last 50 years. Um, may have come on boats or just come with people's um, 
you know, uh, things that they brought or whatever. And it's one of these species that's spread around. And it now occurs um, from areas right across northern Australia. It, it occurs down far as south as Broome in Western Australia, right across the top end, uh, you know, basically usually in towns, um, around buildings, um, and also in, in Queensland, I think almost, I think as far down south as Brisbane now. So and it's still spreading. So it's an example of a species that, that's, um, and again, it lays those eggs, as Keith mentioned, that they're hard, not the parchment eggs, the harder, harder eggs. Um, another group, and now this is um, a group that's, that's, this again is endemic to Australia. So these are called, these are the legless lizards, the Pygopodidae. There's actually uh, two species in New Guinea, but otherwise they're really restricted to Australia. So very much Australasian. Um, and I just, this is an interesting group because if you look here, um, this is a, a Burton's legless lizard, uh, and this is the same animal here. And for a long time, taxonomists felt that the legless lizards were, were closely related to the geckos. They do similar things, they lay two eggs, the geckos usually lay two eggs. They have this strange behaviour where they have this big tongue that they use to, to lick their eyeballs because they don't have eyelids, they just have to lick the spectacle and geckos do the same thing. Some of them have a voice, a lot of geckos have a voice, they make a little chirping noise. Um, and so they were thought to be related and then now again, as we've mentioned, genetic studies keep turning up these things, um, suggesting relationships and they now are very definitely considered to be very closely related to geckos in fact, some people consider that they are within that gecko group and really all they are is geckos that have lost their limbs and become elongated and that now, that now move around by sort of slithering rather than walking around. So even though morphologically they're very different, uh, they're actually very closely related to geckos. So a little bit of an unusual group there. Um, and as I mentioned, about 30 species in Australia, so several genera and about 30 species. All right, so um, just touch briefly on um, the forums. Um, just encourage people to get in there and have a bit of a, have some discussions. There's a few questions there. Um, I just mentioned something that, that people hadn't mentioned, which was that um, birds of paradise, um, because these were um, particularly in terms of um, animals in, in that area of the Malay archipelago, this was a, uh, a group that was was very interested in the birds of paradise and as he mentions here uh, many of my journeys were made with the express object of obtaining specimens of these birds of paradise so there's a lot of interest in these in Europe he traveled all the way to Arrow Island just to find uh, which is right over near New Guinea just to find uh, birds of paradise and was eventually successful um, brought back quite a few specimens but also um, in one of the more kind of uh, unusual events, he actually managed to bring back two live specimens that he bought in Singapore on the, on the way back. So he did actually get them there. Um, he had to feed them all the way back, keep them alive, and then he was worried when he got close to London that it was getting too cold and things like that, but he did eventually get them back, and they were a big sensation in uh, London because no one had seen a live bird of paradise before. People had seen specimens, they'd seen stuffed ones and so on. No one had seen a live bird, bird of paradise, so he managed to get them all the way back to, to England for the first time. Um, as I mentioned, I hope people are reading the Malay Archipelago. Just thought I'd put that in there. It's really interesting if you do travel to Indonesia, if you ever get the chance, take that, take your copy of Malay Archipelago with you. Um, and another thing that I thought I'd mention that um, in relation to this, uh, dispersal and so on, um, I guess another thing we need to think about and that Wallace often talked about was uh, sea levels. So uh, sea levels change over time. One thing that Wallace often mentioned was this idea of the 100 fathom line, which is about 200 metres or so on depth, uh, so under the ocean. And he noticed that, um, he talked a lot about how there's a lot of shallow seas, particularly around places like New Guinea. So here he says that the Arrow Islands and these are some of the other islands New Guinea are very similar in their mammals and birds. And he suggests that they are all united to New Guinea by a shallow sea. And so if we actually look nowadays, and it's interesting that the Wallace actually could, could figure out these things back in the day, 
Um, if we look at this, this shows the seabed. And as you can see, this whole area from Arrow here all the way across northern Australia, all the way down to the Kimberley, is within that 100 fathom line. So last time the sea levels were much lower today in the last glacial period. So maybe only 20,000 years ago, um, when the sea was a long way out and this island of Aru was actually joined to the New Guinea mainland. So animals and plants presumably could move across. And likewise in Australia, this part of northern Australia was joined to New Guinea. This was dry land all the way across um, from Australia to the southern part of New Guinea. Hence, as I was saying, a lot of these savannah plants and so on. This, this area here is actually very similar to parts of northern Australia They're here. So if we think about the sea levels going up and down, it's just another layer um, that's allowing certain things to disperse at certain times. So it's a, a barrier that, that changes over time, if you like. All right, so now just a quick quiz. Um, keep you on your toes. Uh, so we've spoken a bit about the life of Darwin, um, how he published The Origin, um, how he spent his time travelling around, and then Wallace doing similar things in terms of travelling to the Malay Archipelago, um, spending a lot of time there. Um, but we do know that Wallace was Darwin's junior. Darwin was fairly well established already by the time that Wallace sent that letter from the um, Malay Archipelago. Um, and Wallace, in a way, was still establishing his credentials. And actually, the publication of that letter and that, that um, you know, the theory of the natural selection and so on really did um, make Wallace a well-known person so that when he did finally come back to um, to London, which was actually several years after uh, that, that, that dual publication, he was actually quite a well-known figure in scientific circles in London. Um, so we've got a few... Got a few votes here. Let's see how we done. Five. Right, so some people have said ten years. Or oh, but most have said fourteen. Let's see. And okay, there we go. So fourteen years. So most have got it right. Um, so yeah, Darwin was born in 1809, and Wallace in 18, 1823. So really, um, you know, Darwin, Wallace was still at school while Darwin was already off travelling around. And, and doing his thing. So he had a bit of a head start, um, and, and, but eventually, as I mentioned, they, um, they came together there. All right. Um, one other thing that I would, um, I've mentioned in the forums is just about this idea that people have travelled in the tropics, so Darwin and Wallace both did that, which was, I think, really important. And another thing I think that, that doesn't get mentioned often and that it is a similarity between the two of them was that they both had assistants. And I guess in that time, it wasn't common for um, wealthier people to have people that, that assisted them. So Wallace had um, two assistants, one which was, was Charles Allen, who was an English fellow they brought with him. And another one was Ali, who was a, a, a Malaysian. So he spoke Malay and this is a picture of Ali and he spent several years with Wallace helping him collect and, and uh, get specimens. He would go out and collect, you know, butterflies and also birds and so on. Um, but Charles Allen was very important. He collected literally thousands of specimens. So a lot of Wallace's specimens that he brought back to England were actually collected by Charles Allen. And there's some mention of him um, by Wallace, but I haven't actually been able to find a photo of Charles Allen. He ended up living in Singapore and apparently stayed there for the rest of his life. Um, but as far as we know, there doesn't seem to be any photos of, of Charles Allen, so we're not really that sure what he looks like. Um, and Darwin also had an assistant, so this is Sims Covington, who was a cabin boy uh, on the Beagle, and then also actually ended up helping um, Darwin with some of his collecting. So they did have assistants to help them uh, with collecting, but also with other duties as well. So. Um, Probably, probably pretty important and help them be in some ways as productive as they were. All right, um, so a last point here really, um, we're getting towards the end of this webinar, but um, just looking at Wallace's uh, realm, so this is from the Geographical Distribution of Animals, uh, published um, published after the Maya Catharpa Caballado, so in 1876, and in this book, 
Uh, Wallace collected all the information he could about the distributions of animals, and um, it's, it's quite a long book. Uh, again, you can download it from Wallace online, as you can do with the Malay Archipelago or any of other Wallace's publications. But he outlined these regions, which we've seen, these major realms. So there we have the Palearctic, there we have the Ethiopian, the Oriental, and the Australian. Um, but also what he did was he, he talked about sub-regions. So, for example, within uh, Africa, you had this South African sub-region, and you had Madagascar as being a separate area. Uh, you had Australia, but then you had New Zealand as being a separate type of area. So he really summarised all those results, and he delineated these these five geographic regions. And I guess I just wanted to compare this, which is from 1876, which is which is with this, which is from a recent uh, a recent study. And what's interesting, I think, is actually how similar uh, these results are to what uh, Wallace Wallace had suggested. Yeah, so um, I guess this, the, the newer study used all sorts of new genetic techniques and other kinds of, apart from the fact that there have been, you know, uh, an extra hundred years worth of collections and study, there was that, plus completely new approaches to studying phylogeny of animals and, and plants. And um, so with, even with all these genetic groups and genetic studies, genetic techniques, the, Wallace pretty much had you know, pretty much had it right, you know, a hundred years before, uh, at least in, you know, the big picture, picture of it, of these two maps are very similar. Yeah. And even these, like, you know, for example, there's the Madagascan region, which, um, which Wallace identified. It does do this slightly Japanese one, which is perhaps slightly different, but, you know, they're really remarkably similar in terms of, um, you know, this New Zealand here has been so yeah, even with all these statistical techniques and things we have these days. All right, so Wallace did a pretty good job, I think we can say, um, particularly for his time. And I just wanted to, in conclusion, um, here's the Wallace statue that was unveiled at the Natural History Museum in London. This was last year to commemorate uh, 100 years since uh, Wallace passing away in 1913. Um, and a couple of things here. Uh, first of all, um, there, there was a bit of research that went into this statue in terms of trying to find out what Wallace actually wore, um, because there's no pictures of him when he's out collecting in the Malay Archipelago. There's a picture of him in Singapore. There's the other, the other odd picture, but they're always in his civilian clothes, you know, in his nice clothes for wearing in, in town. Um, but from some descriptions and so on in his writings, we can establish so he had some sort of a hat, maybe like a Panama hat. He often wore, he thought he wore long sleeves because he mentions that at one point he peels back his sleeves and the people can see his white skin underneath because they weren't sure what colour his skin was. Um, he wore, wore long trousers. They were often tucked into his boots because he had trouble with leeches in a lot of the places where he went and that was one way of stopping leeches getting in. Um, so in the tropics, obviously, that come one, one thing you, you often come across leeches, one of the unfortunate side, uh, side effects of that. Um, there's his net, so his butterfly net, so invariably was out there trying to catch insects. And apparently this little box um, had some cork in it so that when he collected specimens, he could actually start pinning specimens while he was out in the field. So this is thought to be the sort of look um, that, that he had. And it's interesting that in the... Um, when they introduced the uh, unveil, the Wallace statue, uh, Bill Bailey, who some of you may have, have heard about, he's had a TV show about uh, Wallace and the Malay Archipelago. He actually mentions, um, because they talk about this thing between, you know, Wallace speaking in Darwin's shadow and so on, uh, he actually mentions that um, for him what was, was pretty good was that there's actually an exhibition about Wallace uh, in Australia and of all places, it's in a place called Darwin. And so he did actually mention the, uh, the exhibition that was at the museum in Darwin uh, last year, again, to commemorate uh, the 100, 100 years from Wallace, Wallace passing away. All right, well, um, I just want to say thanks for, to the participants and um, thanks again, uh, Keith. Um, uh, and 
I guess uh, next week we will be uh, bringing it back to northern Australia, so the top end in Darwin. So we've come down through Asia now. Uh, we're restricting our scope and bringing it back now to, to northern Australia. And we'll talk about um, northern Australia itself and the adaptations of the animals and plants and so on. Yep, OK. Um, so I guess I'm just... Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, just to um, remind everybody that it'll be at the same time next week on, on Friday, 11.30 uh, Darwin time, 11.30 a.m. Darwin time. And, uh, yep, so uh, thanks very much, Steve. Yeah, so that's, uh, what's that, so it's 10 o'clock in Western Australia and uh, 12 o'clock, so midday in, 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 eastern, in the eastern states. And whatever time it is in your, uh, your part of the world. Um, so yeah, thanks everybody, and I'll just leave you with uh, a, a slide with a little bit of uh, text here, but um, I'll leave it up here for a minute or two uh, for people to read. Okay, thanks everybody, and goodbye.